you know, after I sold, everyone kind of knew that I had taken some steps back to really learn as much about how to figure out what your shop is worth, how to get through the process, how to understand the agreements. You know, I took probably four or six months to to really wrap my head around it and make sure that, you know, we could get everything we could get because there was no Laura Gay out there to help you at the time. There was nobody. Welcome to the Mind Wrench Podcast with your host, Rick Sellover where minor adjustments produce major improvements in mindset, personal growth, and success. This is the place to be every Monday, where we make small improvements and take positive actions in our business and personal lives that will make a major impact in our success, next-level growth, and quality of life. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Mind Wrench Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Salover. Thanks so much for tuning in and spending a few minutes with me today. And if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button so you never miss another episode. Hey, we all know this past year has been really difficult for most of us to deal with. So if you have some areas in your life you really want to make a change, you really want to make improvements, you want to get to that next level, you have things you want to accomplish but just not really sure how to get there, you need some help, you need a guide, you need a coach, I'd love to be able to help you with some one-on-one coaching. Just go to my website, ricksalover.com, and go to the contact page and drop me a note or just instant message me on Facebook or Instagram. Weeknight and weekend appointments available right now. Hey, this week, I've got a very special guest for the show. Her name is Laura Gay. Laura is the owner of Consolidation Coach out of South Carolina, where she has helped dozens of shops looking to buy a new shop or sell their existing shop navigate through that process for maximum results. Laura has extensive background in the collegiate industry from body shop management to working with the insurance industry for 12 years to owning, successfully running, and eventually selling two of her own very successful collision shops. So naturally, I was very excited to have her on the show and share her expertise with all of you. So without any further ado, let's get to the interview with Laura Gay. Hey, welcome everybody to the Mind Reg podcast. I'm your host, Rick Silover. Thanks for joining me today. And today I got a special guest, uh, Laura Gay from uh, Consolidation Coach. She's dabbled in quite a few ends of the collision business, and she's probably one of the best authorities I've ever run across, uh, all things considered. So, Laura, welcome to the show. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work history and kind of how you went from body shop manager to helping people sell their and buy their next shops. Absolutely. Well, first, before we get started, I want to thank you so much for inviting me on the podcast. Love being part of it and grateful to help and give back to the collision community in any capacity that I can. So first, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity for this evening's podcast. You Um, are welcome. Thank you. And then the, um, as far as your question goes, I guess I would sum it up in one word, and that would be a lot of hard work, focus, determination, and perseverance. I would say probably perseverance is the number one word. Anybody in this industry that's lasted more than 10 or 20 years has perseverance. <laughs> you got to have it. And a, yep. sense of, and a sense of humor and a hard, hard shell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep, yep Absolutely. Um, but quite honestly, you know, um, you know, I'm a firm believer God gives you what you need, you know, and, uh, I grew up in my father's family business. He had two Honda and Yamaha motorcycle dealerships and two used car dealerships. And I worked in them from the time I was, you know, a little, little kid counting Coke money, you know, six, eight years old. I was, I, you know, so I literally walked through that business. I knew every aspect and I could have run that business when I was 16 years old. Cause I, wow. that's all I knew. That's cool. And, and really that was the plan, you know, that, you know, my brothers and I, like any other family business, we would take the family business over. And unfortunately in 1990, when I graduated high school, um, was the same year it was a pretty tough recession. And my father, unfortunately, um, you know, made some bad business decisions along with the, you know, the, the state of the economy and, and people just don't buy motorcycles and cars, you know, when, when things are tough. So my dad ultimately, unfortunately, you know, went out of business. And so where went my, you know, grand plans of life? Mm-hmm. Um, 
fast forward, you know, I was accepted uh, to a couple four year colleges. It just wasn't financially in the plans. Ended up going to community college and was working three jobs, trying to make it all work. Worked a lot of different, you know, oddball jobs, including delivering paint of all things. No kidding. And, I know what that's yeah. like. I've done that. <laughs> you know, I was delivering paint. And um, so, you know, it kind of spawned back to, you know, my interest in wrecked cars, you know, you know, spawned back to even before that when my dad's father owned a body shop and, you know, I'd go up and visit him now and then, you know, it was always, I was always intrigued by it. And then when I was delivering pain, I got intrigued by it. And um, an opportunity came up to go work for a car dealership selling cars. Well, not my bag, you know, not my thing, but I did it. You know, I needed to make money, you know how it is. Mm -hmm. and uh, I went to them, did it for about six months or something, and I just went to them, I'm like, this is just not me. It's not working out. It's not my heart. It's not my soul, and they were like, I don't want you to leave. We see so much in you. How do you feel about working in the body shop, and I said, you know what? Sounds awesome. We'll give it a try. I, I always had interest in rec cars. I think it's, it's neat, and uh, took the opportunity, went back there, and the idea was I was just going to be a secretary and just kind of learn things, you know, and unfortunately, maybe two months in the manager back there was in a very serious, almost fatal motorcycle accident. And they, yeah, it was really crazy, scary. I mean, it was, it was really, it was a terrifying time, honestly. And uh, he was a friend of mine as well. So it was, it was upsetting emotionally as well. And they, uh, the dealer principal asked me if I wouldn't mind holding the fort down, if you will, mm -hmm. until he get, got back to, to work. He said, oh, maybe two weeks a month. Well, that turned, to, turned into almost two years. Um, in that two years time, I had created process before process was a thing, um, had grown the business significantly, like tripled the sales to the point where it had to have a new uh, shop and uh, an additional, we, we, we kind of reinvented it and then had a separate paint shop. Um, just, it was, it was added, I think three DRPs. It's been a while and it's been 30 years now, but, um, really grew the shop, you know, when, when that really wasn't a thing. And, um, so that was kind of like what got my foot in the door and did that for a number of years and then decided that, you know, I wanted to have a family, and, um, you know, the only kind of next step or transition was to leave a shop and maybe become an adjuster, right? So that was the next step. I went to work for Maryland Auto Insurance Fund, had a small career with them as an adjuster, then went to work for, uh, who was next? Progressive Insurance, had a small, I shouldn't say small, a, a fairly decent stint with them, held all sorts of positions with them. Uh, from estimating just regular stuff to handling claims from beginning to end, arbitration, selling salvage. Um, I was their physical damage guru when it came to writing dump trucks, motorcycles. I pretty much wrote anything that was what I'll call out of the norm. Um, left there, went to work at USA, held multiple positions there as well. And just had a really great career um, in the collision trade. And then an opportunity came up to buy a collision center. In fact, um, it was my um, ex-husband's dream to always own a mechanical shop. He, his background was mechanical. Mine was um, collision. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity came along to buy this, this shop, ironically, from my dad's, my dad's friend who had kind of who I went to his shop when I was a little girl, you know, the kind of the person who kind of, for lack of better words, is the one that kind of got my juices going in this business. Right. So um, he, his shop, he was probably 70 at the time. And he came to uh, me and, and my ex-husband and uh, proposed us buying the store. And I wasn't really sure about it. And uh, anyway, long story short, we bought the store and. Um, Hold on a second. So you went from collision shop side to the dark side and then back again to the collision side. That's you don't hear that very often. So go ahead. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. I was on the dark side. You were on the dark side. Don't, don't hold it against <laughs> me. <laughs> Entrepreneurs out there, small business owners, startup businesses and future business owners know exactly how hard, frustrating and time consuming it can be to make something from scratch. 
Just that thought of trying to turn an idea into reality can be completely overwhelming. How do I even get started? Well, with Fiverr, you can turn that idea into something that's easier than you could ever even imagine. With thousands of freelancers around the globe to help you with everything from website design, marketing, video and audio editing, designing your logo, branding your business, SEO, technology and data services, and so much more. I've used Fiverr many times for the small projects I needed done and just didn't have time or budget to add an employee. Had excellent results for a very low cost. I never knew how easy it was to use freelancer services. Simply search for the service you want, set the timeline and pricing you're looking for, and get things moving quickly. Not being able to access all those tech services to launch or grow your business because you didn't know where to start is now a thing of the past. You have all the help you need with Fiverr. That's F-I-V-E-R-R-R dot com. Check out Fiverr and see for yourself what tasks you could be outsourcing and getting things done easier and faster than ever before. Look for the short How Fiverr Works video at the bottom of my homepage at www.ricksalover.com or look for the link in my show notes. Um, I would like to believe when I was on the dark side, though, I really did try to do the right thing, live the golden rule. And I was really blessed when I worked for all of those different insurance companies, they were totally living the golden rule. And I was really able to live my values through them. So well, that's good. Yeah. USA was a great company. I mean, I'm so grateful for that opportunity. They taught me so much. I had such great training. Same with Progressive. Mm -hmm. um, all great opportunities. You know, again, God gives you what you need, gives you that, you know, progression as you need it. Um, so bought the first store. Um, I kid you not, the day we walked in and had uh, seven cars in the lot, uh, I think five employees um, not trying to be gross, but it had the employees were bringing their dogs to work and there was dog poo and pee Ugh. all over the office, uncleaned up, rat poo everywhere. It was really a bad situation. Weeds growing up. I mean, this place needed a whole lot of love. It had possibilities, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, I, uh, myself and my ex uh, husband, we both were very much people that, you know, we had a lot of belief in ourselves, and we just, we knew we weren't going to fail. You know, we knew what needed to happen and we dug in, worked probably 14, 15, 16 hour days, seven, seven days a week for a long time. Um, missed a lot of events, but you know, in the end it paid off, got the second store. Well, I should back up, took that one store from, right at a million dollars in sales to three and a half million. And like, I want to say it was like two years. I can't even remember now. I was thinking it was like two years time. It was like in no time flat. And then uh, by year five, we were doing five and a half million in sales. Um, that's excellent. It that's was crazy. Yeah, that was awesome. And that's in uh, 16,500 square foot of space. Um, and these numbers are based back in 20, like 12 or something. Right. So those were fantastic numbers and we were yes, rocking. Really, that had to be quite organized and quite well run to, to do those kind of numbers at that square footage. So great job. So then you bought a yeah. second shop. One like wasn't I enough, said, right? <laughs> yeah. But it, again, it just became oriented and that was something that was in me. Like I felt like it was born in me. Like it was in me before it was ever a thing in the industry, you know? So it was just a matter of, you know, bringing those new processes and refining. And we were very much about, you know, following, um, you know, the theory of constraints and um, yes. the process improvement model. And um, it just really took off, bought the second store, bought that store. I think at the time, I want to say it was doing 750,000, I think when we bought it and it did 3 million the first year we bought it. Um, just going awesome. in there and, you know, the presence alone, just, it just rocked. We had such a great reputation and brought a few people from the other store to build the culture in the new store. And, um, we had three more stores lined up actually to buy when we sold. Um, unfortunately timing, my, um, ex-husband unfortunately was ill when we sold at the time and just the timing of it, it just, you know, was the time when consult when, uh, consolidation came through right. and, um, you know, came through our market. And it's one of those things when, they, when, when they're there, you've got to act. And, um, so we sold and, uh, the rest is history. <laughs> so you went from, uh, owning a couple shops, sold them to a uh, consolidator. And mm -hmm. then you had obviously some still, uh, 
probably a lot of fire in you to still do something with this industry. And that turned into coaching, right? Yep. So um, basically what happened was, um, you know, after I sold, everyone kind of knew that I had taken some steps back to really learn as much about, um, you know, how to figure out what your shop is worth, how to get through the process, how to understand the agreements. You know, I took probably four or six months to, to really, you know, wrap my head around it and make sure that, you know, we could get everything we could get because there was no Laura Gay out there to help you at the time. There was nobody right. that, that was out there to help you. I mean, this was back in 2014. We sold in 2015, you know, so this is really the beginning of consolidation. Um, so I got thoroughly um, doped up, if you will, you know, on the topic. And um, after I sold, I kind of became locally, you know, where my, my shops were because everybody knew me, you know, just from being in the industry and being very heavily involved over the years. And I just kind of, you know, in my market kind of got known as the in industry know-it-all on this topic. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of helped a lot of shops get through the selling process just because they were my friends, you know? Right. And then one of the shop owners said, you know, Laura, I can't even imagine to have gotten through this without you. And I wasn't even offered nowhere near the service that I do now. I mean, it was like this compared to what I, you know, what I do now. Right. And he's like, you really, really need to think about opening a, a consulting business that specializes in this service because shops really, really need it. And um, he goes, and he said to me that, you know, I, I am a body man. I don't know anything about business or anything about any of this. And if I hadn't had your help, I'd have been lost. And then I sat on that for a few months, honestly. Right. And, um, and that's pretty much how my business, you know, came to fruition. And then I was doing some work through Collision Hub and I was doing some public speaking and doing some um, women events and, uh, some work through some jobbers and different things, just some, some spot spin off things, just cause you, like you said, I'm a type A go get them kind of girl. I can't sit home and, and, uh, eat bonbons. So. Right. But you, but you picked a part of this trade that there was nobody in that space at that time. And quite honestly, I, other than your name, I haven't heard anybody else's name that does what you do. So you're still pretty unique to that position. And with as much consolidation as I've seen in the past, you know, five, six years, that's a great spot to be in right now. You're providing a, an extraordinary uh, service to those that need it. Cause you mentioned, you know, I'm a body man and I own a shop. Well, multiply that situation time about, you know, 30,000. And that's the reality of the collision world out there. Not at all. They're not all professional. They're not all, not all businessmen uh, with degrees or anything else. A lot of them are just, you know, hardworking guys that, evolve from tech to shop owner and they may run a pretty good business but when it comes to that point of selling and that's uh there's a lot to learn there i, I totally i totally get that so uh, i'm glad you do what you do for the for the folks that are out there so thank you it really is a you know a labor of love but it's also really a source for me to give back because a lot of people help me over the industry in the industry over the years a lot of really great people you know and i'm you know, I'm so grateful for, you know, all the different people that helped me. And that's the least that I can do is, is try to provide a service, you know, to these shops. And you only get one chance to sell your shop. You can't screw it up. You know what I mean? Right. And you got to get every penny that, you know, is coming to you, you know, if, you know, and that's the big problem is a lot of times, you know, shop owners, you know, the consolidators will come to them and they'll say, you know, oh, we'll give you $1.5 million for your shop. And then, they hear that and they have no idea what their shop is worth. And then they hang up the phone and they run around, you know, like they just hit the lottery, but they don't understand that a, they, they probably definitely can get more right. and, and they don't understand what $1.5 million mean after, you know, they've gotten the check, you know, it, it's more than just getting $1.5 million. There's, there's tax and so many other things involved. And so things in the payments that, you know, literally can really affect the net um, amount that they realize when it's all said and done. And then additionally, if they own their building and they want to lease it back, understanding that, you know, uh, it was really upsetting. A client had recently tried to sell a shop on his own. And uh, thankfully, due to just timing, he got busy at his shop and 
He just didn't have time to really kind of, for lack of a better word, circle back around and the consolidator got busy and they kind of slipped off of the, you know, they kind of slipped off each other's radar. Right. And he, he sent me his agreements and everything because he decided he wanted to get back on the horse for lack of better words and, and really start looking at this. And thank God that, you know, he didn't move forward with this deal because he would have shorted himself on the leasing. He would have, there was some, some mistakes. I don't want to say mistakes, but things in the uh, agreements that were, <laughs> mm-hmm, that were, yeah. were not favorable. And more importantly, he was, you know, we haven't gotten to this point, but we're definitely going to be able to get him more money. Um, and, you know, like you said, I don't know what the exact dem- demographics are, but I can just tell you from going in and out of body shops, you know, especially over the last five years, all over the United States, I'm going to, I'm going to just guess that probably 75, maybe 80% of all body shop owners are what I like to call reformed body men and reformed painters. Right. There are people that were body men, they were painters and they wanted to own a shop, you know, and it's such an honorable thing to be able to do that. And, and such a, a meaningful thing for, you know, these guys. Um, but unfortunately they just don't have the business knowledge and you just have got to have so much. There's just so much you have to have in your toolbox to combat, you know, selling your shop. So many things that you need to know things that your accountant and attorney just can't help you with. Cause it's just so like specific to what we do. It's different than any, our business. Think about it. Our business is so different than any other business out there. I mean, we're, we are so unique. Absolutely. And, and I'll tell you too, I've had, I've been in this business a long time and I've had great friends that own shops uh, that were former techs or they owned other uh, mechanical businesses or something. They opened a buy shop, but I've had several of them sell out in the past five years that did not um, business wise, were not uh, really prepped to sell their shop, to know what their shop's worth, to know what to ask. Uh, and I've seen a couple of them really, I think lose big time because their egos got in the way and they said, this is my baby and it's worth X. And it was nowhere near worth that. And it cost them several good opportunities because they're holding out for that long dollar that they felt, you know, they deserved because they put their life into this place, but that's not how they base what's a shop's worth. Is it? No. And it's no. funny that you say that you mentioned it because that does happen too, but you know, where shop owners think that the shop's worth more than it really is. But I will tell you more times than enough. I think that shop owners have no idea. And when I tell them what it's worth, they're like, you know, a lot of times they're just really blown away. And, and a lot of times I hear them say to me, are you for real? And I'm like, I'm really for real, <laughs> you know? And, um, I think that, that that's, you know, both sides of the equation can be problematic. You know, Uh, I mean, if you're selling for too much or you're trying to get too much, you know what I mean? I mean, if you're not selling for enough or you're, you know, selling for too, you know, trying to get too much, either way, it it can be catastrophic. Right. So I was reading through a preview. I know you have an article coming out with Body Shop Business, I believe uh, December issue. And uh, it's a great, great article. I think there's going to be a lot of value to anybody that reads that. Um, and I just wanted to key in on a few things that you had in there. So you refer, and I heard you with Mickey Woods on her uh, podcast uh, not long ago, talking about the Joe Biden tax reform. Um, and that seems to be uh, amplifying the need for shops that want to sell to uh, get off their butts and get the signs out on the front lawn, right? I, I understand that's going to impact them. Uh, whenever it goes into play, it will impact them. It's going to cost them money. But how is the how are the buyers, are they using that to their advantage? Are they offering less because they know that's a factor? Or are they just busy trying to expand their footprints at this point? So I don't know if they're really using it as a strategy, uh, per se, maybe a little bit. Um, but I really think that you know, at this point, getting any more deals done, you know, in 2021 is done, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, knocking on Christmas's door practically. Um, And you really need 60 to 90 days minimum to get a deal done. So um, has it been crazy hectic? Heck yes. It's been an absolute madhouse up until about two weeks ago when the door kind of shut on, you know, any further deals. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, they've been really trying to get a lot done because they realize that 
next year, you know, if the Biden uh, reform goes through and, and I'm sure something's going to go through and what that is, we don't know. Um, but, you know, should it go through, it's going to probably do two things. It's either going to make shop owners be more, you know, um, they're not going to probably be as likely to want to sell. You know what I mean? It's, it's going to take a lot more to motivate them because think about it, you know, with some of the taxing, you know, it's, you know, like a deal that's like $1.5 million, you know, depending on how it's taxed. I mean, it could cost any more between 150 and $300,000, roughly an additional tax, uh, depending on how, yeah, it's quite a bit. So uh, when you, when you're realizing that, you know, additional less money than maybe you were going to get in 2021. And again, we don't know what it's going to be. I'm just hypothesizing on some things that, you know, I've read just like everyone else has read. Um, so I don't have, a, I don't have a, just everybody, I don't have the crystal ball. Um, but, um, but also I think they realize that potentially they may have to pay more just like inflation is like, we're going to the grocery store and a can of beans, you know, has doubled in price. And, and ch- have you looked at the price of chicken wings lately? Holy cow, they've doubled. Um, just like we've had inflation as, you know, um, everyday people, you know, I think they realize that they're probably going to have some inflation too, potentially. Oh, absolutely. So I wanted to touch on part of your article. Um, you talked about several issues that, um, are kind of all hitting almost like a perfect storm right now. Right. Um, you've got staff shortages all over the place, which nobody can seem to get around that. It doesn't matter what business you're in, but it hits a collision business too. Um, you got labor rate suppression going on in uh, a lot of areas, if not everywhere. Uh, and you got operational inefficiencies uh, with these shops. And you couple that with, you know, most of these shop owners are, you know, what, 80 some percent are at the age of attrition. So they either want to get out, um, they're frustrated, they're fed up, uh, they want to retire, they want to take the money and run or they just simply don't want to have to deal with the next wave of collision repair and what you'd have to do to be ready for that. Right. That's exactly. You hit the nail completely 100% on the head. I think those are all the driving forces. Um, And, and let it be known that, you know, the independent shop owner or, you know, they are not the only ones that are, that are struggling with this. These, all of these things that you just mentioned the consolidators are struggling with too. Um, I just had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with uh, one of the higher ups at one of the major consolidators about this very topic about, you know, employees and labor rates and, and how they're struggling, you know? And so it's definitely an issue. No one is immune to for sure. Right. Right. Like I said, it just seems to be all converging Even if the MSOs weren't buying shops up, I think you'd still see lots of shops up for sale uh, or just closing the doors. I've seen several small shops just not even try to sell. They're just closing doors going, that's it. I'm done. I'm a three-man shop. I'm not even going to bother trying to sell this thing. I got my money out of it. You know, the place is falling apart. I mean, there's so many of those. I'm in the Detroit market and there's a lot of, a lot of shops in this market. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of them that are probably the best ones you could buy, right? So I'm seeing a lot of that happen right now. And I would say, are the MSOs, or I would ask you, because you see more of this than I would, are the MSOs uh, leveraging their, um, I'd say their operational uh, efficiencies to buy these shops and then turn that profit margin around? Because I think if you ask most shop owners what the profit margin is, either A, they don't know, or B, uh, they're guessing it's really low, right? Right. And what's, what's a good margin for collision shops right now, a well-run collision shop? So that's a really good question about the margins and such. And I will tell you this, you have to think of it like this. As a consolidator, they're buying paint cheaper. They've got agreements with the insurance companies for back-end rebates. Um, they have other um, things that, you know, set up for them that, you know, allow them to have more profitability there. They, they just do everything on a more global footprint. You know, I mean, they have a person uh, that at every shop that 
I shouldn't say at every shop, but they have a person that takes care of all of the little nuances that the shop owner always ends up taking care of. There's one person at every consolidator that takes care of all that stuff, like paying the rent. They have like, you know, each, each consolidator has somebody that takes care of that paying all of the utility bills. They have somebody that takes care of that, you know, instead of having in so many cases where the shop owner has to do a lot of those, those things that need to take place daily. So yeah, absolutely. That plays plays a big part um, in why they are able to be successful and the, and the shop is not. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and people don't think about it. Counting pennies is so important. Pennies add up into dollars, dollars add up into hundred dollars, you know, and I used to always do with my employees. We had this thing. It started out with fine $30 on every estimate. Then it went to fine 50. Then it went to fine a hundred. Then it went to fine to 200. And we used to give out these awards and prizes and things for basically focusing, you know, on finding that money. And ultimately that revenue, that little extra that you find is the difference between being prof- being profitable and not being profitable. I think it's also the difference between whether you're going to put a for sale sign in your front yard or not too. Cause I think the ones that have figured out they can make money in this business. And although I'll, I'll hear a million people tell me, you know, the days of making great money in this business are gone. They're not, it's just, it's more difficult and you really have to be determined and you have to be uh, rigorous about how you go about it. And you can't miss a dime on any of these jobs. You get paid what, you, what you're supposed to get paid for, however you need to do that. And um, to your point though, the pennies do add up to dollars and that's what this business is about. And as much as we're going to talk about consolidators and buying shops and selling shops, um, I don't want anybody to leave this podcast uh, as a shop owner, not thinking that you know, is there a way I can still salvage my business? Cause I got to believe there is, I, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are, but you know, the rate of consolidations has been brisk, but do you see a saturation point? I mean, is it, I think it's probably at 40% right now is maybe MSO business. Do you see a saturation point where they go, I think we're, we have a big enough footprint. Oh, That is going to happen and it's imminent. And there's lots of markets in the United States that have not been tapped yet. Detroit's a perfect example. I think the only consolidator there is um, Gerber, I think. Um, But there, no one else is really ready to tap that market. And there's a lot of other markets out there, you know, that are in the same situation. Because we're the cheapest market around. (laughs) Our rates are the lowest in the country. That's why this is the last place they want to be. But I listen, Laura, I see them. They're popping in. Um, it's, it's just a matter of time, I think. So, yeah, but, um, to your point, um, I think that we're probably have about two and a half, maybe three years left of consolidation. And then once that's done, um, then it's going to be a matter of green fielding and brown fielding, um, you know, new places that, you know, for lack of better words, the little holes that aren't filled, Um, but, but I think we're probably two and a half to three years from that. And so what that means is in two and a half, three years, I'm going to need a job. So, you know, thank you, Laura. (laughs) (laughs) Well, plenty of people will know your name and you'll, you'll, I'm sure you have plenty of places to go if that well runs dry. So trust me. So that's kind of what I was thinking too, is that it's going to hit a saturation point. I just don't know what that looks like. And, and, uh, I, I don't think they want all the business. And I think, the guys that have and the gals that have shops right now, I think there's hope that they can still hang on and uh, be an independent that's not part of an MSO that can still make money and still, you know, have a great business and uh, profitable business. I just think it's going to be more difficult. And I know a lot of it's got to do with um, the way we have to repair cars now. It's very, it's very uh, intense. Uh, the equipment requirements are off the hook. Uh, their training requirements are incredible, but I truly believe if people really want to make their business work, uh, they'll find a way to make it work and they'll put the effort into it. They'll put money into it. Uh, I just don't want people to give up on, uh, on owning a body shop just yet. So yeah, I don't either. And please know from the bottom of my heart, I don't, I, there's, there is truly a niche out there for the independent shop owner. And if any point in my career, that I've ever seen the independent collision shop owner really has a point right now where literally it's, it's, 
you can make a decision. Are you going to sell or are you going to go down the other road and, and stay in? And I really believe that there are a lot of people that still want to only deal with an independent shop because they like the customer service. They like the personal touch, the personal connection that they still can talk to the owner. Um, and let's face it, you know, there's a lot of people that are really like car guys and car girls, you know, they're just not going to be comfortable, you know, taking their baby to, um, a, you know, corporate body shop, nothing against them, but it's just, right. it, it's that personal connection and that knowing that trust that, that if they take it down to their friend, John at, you know, XYZ body shop that John is going to personally make sure that their car is fixed correctly. Um, and there, and that's going to be, in my opinion, the, the, the niche that people are going to need to focus on is that, you know, um, fixing cars, right. Which has always been a niche, um, making sure you get paid, you know, for everything that you do and, and shops are going to struggle. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's going to be roses and sunshine, um, cause you are going to struggle. You know, the insurance companies are going to continue to pay slow, um, which is going to create issues with, um, you know, cash flow within the business. Um, so you're going to have to be very strategic about this if you decide to stay in, but I can't think of a more, a better time to stay in because at some point the labor rates and everything, they are going to tail whip. You're going to see all of this start to come around. The, the globe is going to shift. It's just going to take a little more time. Right. No, I, I feel the same way, Laura. I've got, uh, I've got shops that are right around the corner from consolidators that are thriving. Okay. Cause they're doing high quality, uh, high end collision repairs. Uh, they have all the equipment. Uh, they've got good marketing. Uh, they've, they're doing things right. And they're busy despite the fact that they're surrounded by some MSOs right now. And so I got to have faith that there's a lot more shops that can be in that exact same spot. So. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. I agree with you a thousand percent on that. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So um, obviously there's still going to be shops selling out. There's still, you said you've, you've had plenty. I think the last time we talked, you had about a dozen deals that were still cooking. And even with the Biden thing that's going to happen maybe sometime next year, shops will still be selling. So what can a shop do if, if they're at that point and they know I'm done, that's it. I, listen, I just, I'm 65, I'm 70, I'm 75. I don't have kids that are going to take this over. I just need to get out and I want to enjoy some time on the beach or on a golf course or on my boat or whatever. Um, what can they do to start preparing themselves like contacting you? Uh, to get themselves in the right spot to sell? Because I'm sure there's some things that shops probably need to do first before they actually list their place, right? So quite honestly, I mean, there's just so many answers to that question. And I think the easiest thing is to start out with figuring out, you know, what your, what your shop's worth and then go from there. You know, sometimes it makes sense to really take a year or two and focus on improving your sales, you know, do whatever it is that you need to do to, to increase your sales. Because quite honestly, sales and profits are ultimately what drives the sale price. I mean, there's other variables, don't get me wrong. Um, but I would say those are the key components or the, the major key components to what the, the, the value of the business is driven off of. So that would probably be the key thing. And a lot of times, uh, and part of my service is when I do a valuation for a customer, um, you know, I kind of look at the, the shop as a whole and, and I will give them advice. Hey, you know, if you, if you want to take a little more time to do X, Y, and Z, and then we can go to market. But I will tell you, it seems to me that the trend is most people, when they get to me, they've made the decision The for lack of better words, they put the key in the ignition and they've turned it. They're done. They're out. They're ready to, they're not willing to invest any more time, effort, or energy in it. The, you know, it is what it is. You know what I mean? And, um, and, and they go, I would say 99.9% .9 of them. That's the direction that they go in. Okay. Well, I'll suggest everybody out there that's in that spot before they put the key in the ignition, maybe give Laura a call. She, she can do a free uh, consultation with you over the phone and can at least maybe set your mind in the right direction on, do I need to tap the brakes a little bit or just go ahead and turn the ignition and go and get out? So um, hopefully they'll do that. 
because I, I tell you, if, if I had, you know, a couple million wrapped up in a shop, I think I'd want to make all the right choices before I, before I sold. So anyway, so um, I want to ask you one more question. I know we're running a little longer than, uh, than we thought, but it's been, this has been great information. It's a great conversation. I could talk for another two hours, but nobody will listen for another two hours. Trust me. So in, so in fairness to our listeners, I had one final question. So we have a lot of shop owners with 30, 40, 50 years of industry knowledge, right? That have now exited their, they're heading for the golf course, they're heading for their boat, they're heading for Maui, wherever they're going, whatever they're doing, God bless them, that's great, they earned it, they deserve it, but some of those folks are still going to want to, they're going to go play for six months, right, then they're going to go, hmm, seems like there's something I should be able to do, right, I don't, I feel like I'm wasting away here, I got all this knowledge to share, is there some other spots that these folks can help our business contribute some of their knowledge uh, some of their learnings um, contribute some of their, you know, uh, their talents to the business. And uh, do you see some ways that they could probably be still part of the collision center uh, business without actually owning a shop? So I'm really glad you asked this question because I will tell you a former body shop owner is probably one of the most sought after people <laughs> It's really crazy. I get lots of calls with people looking for people for different positions in this trade and even outside this trade, because people that know body shop owners know that they can handle anything. They're multitaskers. They can clean a toilet. They can uh, scrub a bumper. They can wash a car. Um, you know what I mean? They, they, they just, they can look at books. They can, um, do accounts payable, accounts receivable. They can deal with customers. They can deal with insurance adjusters. I mean, there's nothing a body shop owner can't do. So because of that, because they're so resourceful and so, um, diverse, they really are very much sought after for many different positions. And that's what's awesome about a lot of shop owners, especially guys that are in their 40s that are selling. They're getting a lot of really cool opportunities to go do other things, maybe in the collision trade, maybe not in the collision trade, but some really, really cool stuff. Um, they're getting opportunities to go and do. Well, that's awesome. Well, I really hope I hope I see that. I hope uh, I hope for any of the owners that are out there that uh, have burned through their first six or eight months of doing nothing but enjoying life. <laughs> That if they get if they get a little tired, a little bit bored with that, uh, I think there's a lot of shops out there that could use expert help uh, in some uh, way or another. And there's probably a lot of consulting and, and things like that that they can do as well at their uh, at their own pace, uh, on their own schedule as as they uh, as they choose to. So I hope I hope to see a lot more of that. And uh, if I was a shop owner and I was retiring, I think I'd want to keep contributing. I'm, I've been in this industry for a long time and, uh, and I'm doing this because I want to keep contributing. I want to keep uh, giving back. Uh, it's been a great trade for uh, so many people for a long time and uh, we're not done yet. Right. So. Yep. hundred percent. That's exactly why I'm here too. Um, I'm doing it too. You know, one, I got bored, but you know, I felt like it was something I needed to do to give back. You know, I just got so it, it, it just taxed me really uh, terribly, you know, when I would see shop owners or hear stories where, you know, the shop owner didn't get what they should have gotten. And they're just like me. They work their ass off just like me. Right. They, they missed, you know, for me, it was, it was my son's golf matches, you know, and my son was real sickly and in and out of the hospital a lot. And, at doctor's appointments. And a lot of times his dad would take him or I would take him, or we couldn't go together as a family. And, you know, there were so many things that he and I both missed, you know, because we were just so wrapped up with those businesses and everybody shop owner is just like that. They've missed those ballet recitals. They've missed those family events. And now is the time for them to reap the rewards for all their hard work, their dedication, their focus, and everything they've given um, it's time for them to, to reap those rewards. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I wish all those people nothing but the best. So Laura, it's been great talking to you today. I'm so glad you were uh, able to make the time to be on the show. Um, I think we could probably have one or two more of these sessions at some point in the near future. Hopefully everybody gets a chance to see your article when it comes out uh, in Body Shop Business Magazine. 
I know I'll be looking for it. I've, I've seen the preview and I think it's great, but uh, hopefully it gets out there and hopefully everybody reads that and, and uh, it helps them in some form or fashion. So I will make sure um, I'll leave all your contact information uh, in the show notes, but if somebody needs you, so uh, just a quick chance to sell your services uh, before we get out of here, what's the best way to uh, get a hold of you and, and uh, what would you like to say? So best way to reach me is on my cell phone, um, 301-399-8675. And literally, um, it lays right here on my desk. And um, I really do try to answer it every single time. If I I can't answer it, I'll text you, tell you, I'll call you right back. Um, I don't keep traditional office hours because I realize most body shop owners during the day, they're doing what they do best, run their shop. So be available for morning or at night or whenever they need, whenever they can talk, when it's slipping away to go to lunch or whatever time it is. So please know, call me anytime, text me anytime. I'm on Eastern time, um, anytime between 7 a.m. and like 10 p.m. And, um, and, I, and I do all levels of, you know, help with body shops wanting to sell. It could be doing a valuation. It could be helping you understand the process, you know, from beginning to end, helping you with the actual process from beginning to end. Um, I consult on all levels. So please know, give me a call. I'd love to help you in any way I can, even if we're just chatting it up. Give me a call. Awesome. Well, thank you, Laura. I appreciate it very much. Glad to have you on the show again. And thank you listeners for tuning in today and listening to the show. And I hope you got some value out of this and I hope it, uh, hope it helps you make some better decisions and uh, uh, decide the way your future is going to go and what you decide to do. So anyways, thanks again for listening and have a great week. If you like this episode, please, please, please go to Apple podcasts or Spotify and rate it, share it and leave a review. When you share this podcast with others, that's how we grow. And when the show grows, I can serve more people with my messages. I appreciate you, and I hope you have an awesome and productive week. I can always be reached at www.ricksillover.com, where you can find all my social media links, podcast episodes, blog posts, and much more. (laughs) 